So it's my privilege to introduce our first main session speaker. He comes to us from Escondido URC in Escondido, California. Please give a warm welcome to Reverend Angelo Contreras. What a fantastic third verse that is, right? That grace of God, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. That's a prayer that uh, we should all be regularly praying. It's good to be here with you guys. What a privilege it is to speak to you this week. I'm looking forward to bringing three messages to you. Um, my first message is strictly on following Christ. Our theme is... Follow the leader. And that's a theme that comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 24. If you would, open your Bibles to Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done." Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. As I said, our theme, and as you probably know, our theme is follow the leader. What a great theme, how applicable that is, because we're all familiar with following today, right? We follow many people today. You probably follow people on social media, blogs, postings. What are some of the things that you tend to follow? I follow a few health and fitness experts, particularly those who have something good to say about mobility and flexibility and longevity. You can tell a lot about a person based on who or what they follow. What does it say about me, given that I follow some experts on mobility and flexibility. What well, says that I'm at an age in my life where I have to start focusing on those kinds of things. I'm not in my 20s anymore where flexibility came so easy. I actually hiked today, was probably the wrong thing to do, and I'm right now suffering from that. Well, our theme text, Matthew 16, speaks of following Christ. What does it say about us that we follow Christ? You can learn a lot about someone by who they follow. Many people in Christ's day followed Christ. Large crowds gathered together and followed Jesus Christ. As I said, I'm sure you follow some people on social media, and maybe some people follow you on social media. Of those people that follow you, how many of them really know you? How many of them really know who you are? I don't mean they, they maybe met you one time, they're an acquaintance of yours. I mean, they really know you. You see, many people followed Jesus in his day, people who maybe met him, maybe spoke with him, maybe had a conversation with him, but how many of those people actually knew Jesus? Sadly, very few people knew Jesus of Nazareth. In fact, the Bible makes a sharp distinction between those who knew of or about Jesus and those who were his disciples, those that we would describe as followers of Jesus Christ. See, there were many people who wanted to be associated with him. They wanted to be around him. They wanted to see him do a miracle. Maybe they wanted him to do a miracle for them. 
these people are kind of like uh, those who maybe follow you on social media, but they don't really know you. They're possibly acquaintances, but they don't know you. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with accepting a friend request or making a friend request of someone that you really don't know but you want to follow. My point is this. There were many people who knew of Jesus, but few really knew him. Few really followed him. Few, strictly speaking, were his disciples. I hope and pray today that you are someone that doesn't just know of Jesus or know about Jesus, but you're someone who knows Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I hope and pray that you consider yourself a disciple of Jesus Christ. I hope and pray that you are following him. And so I want to focus on that with you this evening. What does it mean to follow Jesus Christ? And I want to turn to a passage just a few chapters prior to our theme passage here. I want to turn to chapter 8 of this book of Matthew. If you would, turn there with me. And as you're turning there, let me just say that our theme verse comes from a a text or a part of the Bible which is considered to, to, to talk about the cost of following Christ. I want to focus on following Christ, strictly speaking. And chapter 8, verses 18, gives us a a picture of that. Just a brief uh, few contextual comments on this. Chapters 4 through 7 are chapters where Jesus announces his kingdom. We know those chapters as the Sermon on the Mount. Well, just after the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus and, and, and Jesus announcing his kingdom, we come to chapter 8 and particularly verse 18. And what we have there are two men desirous of following Jesus. And we have Jesus' response to their desire. It says there, now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. There's some interesting encounters. Maybe more interesting is the way that Jesus responds to these two men and their desire to follow him. I think the first thing we can gather from this text in regards to following Jesus is that following Jesus is more than simply having a desire. These men had a desire. They both express in their own way a desire to follow Jesus Christ. Desire is necessary. It's a necessary part of following Christ. But desire on its own is not enough. I recall when I first came to the Lord, when I first became a Christian in my early 20s, I had a desire to follow Jesus Christ. You see, I was raised in a Christian home. I had faithful Christian parents who tried to raise me and my brothers in a godly way. Sadly, I rejected my faith in the early years of my life. As far back as I can remember, I didn't appreciate the Christianity that my parents were raising me under. I didn't want to go to church. I didn't want to read the Bible. I didn't even want to hear it read at family devotions. I didn't want my friends in the neighborhood or my friends at school to know that I was forced to go to church. I was ashamed of my Christian upbringing. I was ashamed of Christ. So I turned away from my Christian upbringing, and in my teenage years, I did whatever I could to get out of having to attend church or to be at family worship. But then in my early 20s, the Lord graciously convicted me of my sin. He gave me the grace to believe, and I expressed faith in Jesus Christ. 
and entrusted myself to him for the forgiveness of my sins. But even with my conversion, I still wrestled with competing desires. I had a desire to follow Christ, and yet at the very same time, I also had a desire to live for myself. I wanted, in a sense, to have my cake and eat it too. And so I set out to remedy the competing desires that battled within me, the desire to live for Christ and the desire to live for myself. Let me ask you, what would you say to a young person with competing desires like that? What would you say to them? Well, let me tell you what the Bible says. It says, kill the desires that compete with your desire for Christ. Kill the desires that compete with the desire to live for Christ. See, desire is not enough to follow Christ. It's necessary. Desire is involved in the equation of following Christ, but it's not enough. Now, don't get me wrong. Desire, as I said, is necessary. You must have desire. Both of these men in Matthew 8 had a desire to follow Christ, but their desire, as pointed out by Christ, is not enough. Now, you know what I mean when I say that desire is necessary but not enough. Think of a recipe with me. Maybe some of you bake or maybe some of you have taken up barbecue. I love to barbecue. I also love to eat barbecue. Who doesn't? When you follow a recipe, there are all kinds of necessary ingredients for a recipe that on their own are not sufficient. They're not enough. One of my daughters is learning this very thing. She's taken up baking and in her first few attempts at baking, she quickly learned, as did her mom and I, that she must follow the recipe to a T. I don't have to tell you about the uh, disasters she faced when she tried to cut corners and skip out on some of those necessary ingredients. I don't have to tell you about the challenge of tasting some of the things that she baked when she didn't follow the recipe. But you get my point, right? When following Christ, desire is a necessary part of it, but on its own. Not enough. These two men, they, they desired to follow Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you have a desire to follow Christ. You've been raised in the church your entire life. You desire to follow Christ. Or maybe you haven't been raised in the church your entire life, but through some providential events, you're here today and you too have a desire to follow Christ. That's a wonderful thing. It's wonderful to desire to follow Christ. Hold on to that desire. I, want to, I don't want to discourage that desire. I want to encourage that desire. I want to fan the flame of that desire. And I want to encourage it by saying to you, combine that desire with other necessary elements, ingredients, if you will, to follow Christ. Well, what else is involved in following Christ? Well, notice how Jesus responds to these two men. He gives a particular response to each of these men. And in each response, we see Jesus focusing or emphasizing a different point. The first response of Jesus is, Foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Initially, this might sound like something of a bizarre response from Jesus. Especially since the man had just expressed a desire to follow him. A strong desire, we might say. The man says, wherever you go, Lord, I will go. That would seem like a good thing. It would seem like a, a strong desire. Look down with me at verse 19. Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. I'm sure that the di disciples, after hearing this man say this, thought to themselves, Lord, this man will follow you anywhere you go. This is the kind of disciple that we want to include in our group, don't we? This reminds me of a famous line from one of my favorite movies. If you took uh, my workshop last year on dating and relationships, then you should recall that I told you that generally I tend to be something of a romantic person. 
Well, as a romantic person, I tend to enjoy and appreciate romantic movies. One of my favorite movies is the movie The Last of the Mohicans. Maybe you're familiar with that movie. It's a bit of an old movie, so I wouldn't be surprised if you were not. But it's one of those movies, from my perspective, that has everything to it. History, war, love, romance, action, redemption, drama, suspense. Well, at a certain point in that movie, the the main character, in an effort to save the woman that he loves, he has to leave her. He has to leave her and he has to jump into this, this huge waterfall. You see, the enemy tribe is bearing down upon them. And if he stays there and there's a fight between the enemy tribe, then he knows that the enemy tribe will likely kill all of them. But if he and his adopted father and adopted brother jump into this waterfall and leave, then there's a chance that they'll just simply take the women away as prisoners. And his plan is to find her. And so he, before jumping, he makes this very romantic, passionate statement. He says, you stay alive. No matter how far No matter how long, I will find you. I will find you. And you see the the passion and the romance in what he says. The statement of the scribe in the text before us is something of a passionate declaration. Not a romantic declaration in the sense of love, but romantic in the sense that it's emotional, it's exciting. Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. I think this declaration, this passionate declaration could raise a question for all of us today. How many of us today could declare something like that to Jesus? How many of us are passionate about following him? How many of us have a strong desire to follow him? Now, Jesus, realizing that passion, desire is not enough, he pushes back on this man's desire by saying, foxes have holes, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. What is Jesus saying with this? Well, Jesus is saying, in summary, that one must understand what's involved in following him. Desire is not enough. Zeal is not enough. Passion is not enough. Desire must be combined with faith. Faith. And what is faith? Faith is knowledge and trust. Faith is knowledge and trust. Hatterberg 21 says, what or asks, what is true faith? True faith is, o- is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold for true all that God has revealed in his word, but Also a hearty trust which the Holy Spirit works in me by the gospel. Do you think this first man was looking to follow Jesus in faith? Sadly, he wasn't. The text tells us that he was a scribe. Who were the scribes? They were experts in the law. Scribes were also men who sat in honor in the synagogues. This was a a religious gatekeeper, if you will. He was an expert in the law, and that expertise gave to him authority among the people. He was familiar with being held in honor by the people. He was familiar with being held in esteem by the people. Jesus knew this. And so when the scribe comes to him and says, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Although initially this may sound full of desire, full of passion to follow Christ. Jesus understands where this man is coming from. This man was used to human power, prestige, authority, and honor. And he was looking to Jesus to provide more of that for himself. So Jesus knew he wasn't genuinely interested in following him in faith. This man wasn't looking to Jesus as his savior We see this even more clearly in that the scribe calls Jesus teacher. You see, you can often tell a lot about a person by what they call you. This man didn't call Jesus Lord. This man didn't call Jesus son of David. He didn't call Jesus Savior. 
He called him teacher. To the scribe, Jesus was just a teacher. Now granted, a very good one. The scribe would have noticed that. He would have noticed the crowds that followed Jesus. But to the scribe, Jesus was not Lord and Savior. In fact, I don't think this scribe really knew what Jesus and his life and ministry were all about. I think if he did, he likely would not have declared this passionate statement. This man was interested in Jesus for worldly power, for worldly prestige, worldly honor. But you see, following Christ means following him in faith. Faith in who he is. Faith in what his ministry was really all about. Now I think we all know that desire is a necessary element of following Christ. But zeal, desire, Passion without faith can be dangerous. I don't mean to continue to bring up my workshop from last year, but imagine dating someone, someone who desires you but doesn't really know you. This person likes you. Maybe they've even professed love for you. They talk a lot about you. They can't stop talking about how much they like you. But how can they really like you or love you when they don't really know you? The truth is, they simply desire you. The question is, why? Why do they desire you if they don't know you? See, oftentimes people desire us without knowing us, and they most likely do so out of selfish, self-centered reasons. That's probably how Jesus felt when this scribe confessed this passionate statement to follow him wherever he would go. Passionate, certainly, but not a statement coming from faith. You see, the scribe is an example of the crowd. The crowd that followed Jesus but really didn't know him or his ministry. In fact, who Jesus was and what his ministry was really all about was contrary to what many of the people thought that his life and ministry should be about. The people saw Jesus' miracles. They heard his teachings. They were amazed by him. They were impressed by him. They were fascinated with him. They were excited and passionate about Jesus. I think that's a good way of capturing what the people thought of Jesus in his day. They were excited about him. They were romantic about Christ. Again, not romantic in the sense of love, but romantic in the sense of emotional, passionate, excited. Jesus was to the people in his day something of a celebrity. People love celebrities, don't they? We all love celebrities. In my house were big Golden State Warrior fans. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area, and so I grew up liking and appreciating the Golden State Warriors. So knowing that, who do you think has celebrity status in my house? Steph Curry. Steph Curry. In the eyes of my daughters, Steph Curry can do no wrong. He's almost perfect in their eyes. I have to keep reminding them he's just a man. He's got celebrity status. Think of a celebrity that you would like to meet. Maybe spend a day following. Maybe an athlete, an actor, musician, performer, speaker. We all have these kind of American idols, right? Not idols in the sense of idolatry, but American idols in the sense of cultural icons that we appreciate. I don't know much about Taylor Swift, but I know there's Swifties. Any Swifties here? Not too many, huh? Not too many. What's a Swiftie? Someone who follows Taylor Swift. Why? They don't know Taylor Swift. They don't know what she's about. They don't know what she's really into. But they're excited about her, right? They're excited about her and her music. So you know what I mean. Jesus was like a celebrity to many of the people in his day. 
They were excited about him. He was famous in their eyes. And they projected that fame upon him. But they really didn't believe in him. They didn't know what Jesus was all about. Foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus was a man of sorrow, wasn't he? He was a man who would be betrayed by the people. He was a man who would be rejected by the people. He was a man who came into this world to serve and to save the lost. Jesus came to serve and to save. He came to lay down his life for those who would follow him in faith. How does that kind of Jesus sound to you? That doesn't sound very much like a celebrity, does it? Truth is, nobody wants to follow a servant. Think of the celebrities that we like. Think of the people we like to follow. Compare those people to the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. Do you think the people would have really followed Christ if they knew what he was really all about? Are you willing to follow Jesus knowing what he is all about? Are you willing to follow Jesus knowing that you will have to give up your life to follow him? Again, foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What does that mean to you? How does that uh, apply to to you. Jesus is responding here to the scribe by saying, I don't even have a place to lay my head. Is that who you want to follow? You want to follow me wherever I will go? I don't have a bed. I don't have a home. I'm homeless. I'm houseless. I'm a sojourner, a wanderer, a pilgrim, a nomad in this world. Jesus is essentially saying, is that what you are interested in? Do you really want to follow me? Jesus is being real with this man, isn't he? Yes, he's pushing back on this man's desire, but Jesus is being real with him. You see, Jesus Christ was not into sugarcoating things so that people might follow him. He didn't go around telling people what they wanted to hear so that they might possibly follow him. Jesus wouldn't be into likes and thumbs up today on social media pages. He's not a social influencer. He wasn't simply trying to get clicks on his media page. He wasn't looking for followers simply to have more followers. Jesus came into the world to seek and to save the lost came to give his life for sinners. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, he came to die for those, so that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for him. Is that you? Are you a sinner in need of the salvation that can only come through Jesus Christ? If that's the case, then follow him. Follow him passionately. Follow him. Because when you place your faith in Jesus Christ and follow him as the savior of your life, then you indeed will follow him wherever he will go. And that won't be some overly romantic uh, declaration and claim. It will be a real and genuine expression of the faith that you have in him. Because the truth is Jesus is much more than simply a celebrity. Jesus is more than just a teacher. He is the savior of the world. And he's seeking genuine followers who will place their faith in him. You see, young people, I'm of the opinion that the call to follow Christ is a call that we need to revisit over and over. We need to feel the weight and the magnitude of that call to follow Christ. We need to reflect upon how and where we might be not taking that call serious. 
toying with following Christ. Thinking of as him as something much less than what he really is. Because the call is serious. It's a serious call. We see this particularly in Jesus' response to the second man who desires to follow him. The text presents us with a disciple. And this disciple says, Lord, let me first go and bury my father, and then I'll follow you. Notice first that this is a disciple. He's a disciple. He would have been someone who had been following Jesus. He would have been familiar with Jesus. He was probably more serious than the scribe. Maybe he even had faith in Jesus. Maybe he was one of the 12. We don't know. Maybe he was one of the 72. We don't know. Either way, he's called a disciple. That implies knowledge of Jesus, a relationship with Jesus. And notice what he says. Let me first go and bury my father. Now that doesn't seem like an outrageous request, does it? In fact, in that day, the burial of a parent was taken with the utmost care and seriousness. The teachers of the law taught that burying one's parent excused them from personal religious commitments. So this man is saying, allow me to first bury my father and then I'll come and follow you. What this man says here expresses a divided commitment to Jesus. He thought it was appropriate to put concern for his earthly father, parents, family, ahead of his faith and commitment to Christ. Although this may have seemed like a justified request, what was really happening here was that he was not fully grasping the seriousness of following Jesus Christ. We really get the point of the seriousness of following Christ when we look at Jesus' response in Luke 9, which is a parallel passage to this. Where Jesus says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. See, following Jesus is a serious matter. It's so serious that it must take priority in a person's life who desires to follow Jesus Christ. If you've chosen to follow Christ, he must be first. He must be first over our family over our plans, over our dreams, over our expectations. However good those things might seem to us, however appropriate or justified, our commitment of faith in Christ must take priority. Listen to how Jesus puts it in Luke 14. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes... If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Wow. Wow. Those are heavy words. Those are words we often don't hear. Those are words we often don't think about. Those are serious words. I remember when I was your age having rejected my Christian upbringing. But I think if someone was to ask me, maybe they did and I don't recall, but if someone was to have asked me at that time, if I thought I would ever take my Christian upbringing seriously, I think I would have said something like, yeah, when I grow up, sure, I think I'll take my Christian faith serious at some point. When I get older, when I get married, when I have a family. But now, I just want to live a little. I just want to live a little. I think that's the way many young people think about faith in Jesus Christ. Having been raised in the church their entire lives, having been tempted to take that wonderful blessing of being raised in the church for granted, sure, I'll take my faith serious 
when I get older, when I get married, when I have a family. But at this point, I want to do other things. My faith is just not my top priority. To those of us who would say and think something like Jesus or something like that, would, uh, Jesus would say, let the dead bury the dead. Let the dead bury the dead. If we think that way, if we would say something like that, we would not be worthy of following Christ. Now that might sound harsh, but again, Jesus is being real here. He's being genuine. He's being straight up with anyone who would not make faith in him their single greatest priority in life. See, Jesus says here, let the dead bury the dead. What that implies is that those who do not follow him are dead. While those who do follow him are alive. And what this means, young people, is that following Christ is a matter of life and death. Following Christ is a single most important matter of our lives. We shouldn't presume to kick the can down the road in regards to our faith in Jesus Christ. Following Christ is not something that we can presume upon because we can't presume upon our lives. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. I'm sure you all heard about the assassination attempt on President Trump. You probably also heard that a man lost his life that day. That man did not know that going to that rally would result in him losing his life. How could he have? He didn't know. How could anyone know? Now I know this is the most difficult thing to get young people to understand and appreciate. It's difficult to get young people to understand that life is short. Life is short. You are not invincible. I remember feeling that way. I remember feeling when I was younger, invincible and feeling like there was so much time ahead of me. There was so much life ahead of me. Sadly, we are not invincible. And we can't presume to know that there is a lot of time ahead of us. The reality is life is short. Maybe you're beginning to realize that. Just gave a devotion to my youth group on time and how time does not belong to us. It belongs to the Lord. And the Lord determines to do with time whatever he determines according to his purposes. And so I pray, as Psalm 90 calls us to do, that the Lord is teaching you to number your days so that you may gain a heart of wisdom. Because sadly, it is foolishness to think that life is long and that there's so much time ahead. You see, if you young people would ask anybody here that you think to be old or older, I'm sure all of those people would tell you how short life is, how fast life goes by. Again, maybe some of you are figuring that out. Some of you here are seniors or just graduated high school. Those four years of high school, how fast did that go by? I'm certain you'll say they flew by. Every year from now on will go faster and faster. So whether you're a recent graduate or just finishing your freshman year, the reality is life is short. And the call to follow Jesus is serious. And so I encourage you tonight, young people, to take your faith in Jesus Christ, following him, serious. Stop uh, dividing your commitment to Christ. Follow him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Follow him with a single-minded devotion. He's the Savior. He's your Savior. He's lived and died for you. He is worthy of that single-minded devotion that you can offer to him. 
I mentioned in the beginning of this lesson that many people followed Christ in his day, but they didn't really know him. And those people can, were, can be comparable to those who maybe follow you and don't really know who you are. Young people, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know him? Or do you just know about him? You see, you can follow him and just know of him or about him. I encourage you, follow Christ. Know him, pursue him, desire him, place your faith in him, and take that faith serious. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the words of Scripture. We thank you for how pointed they are to us. We thank you for how they present to us our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the call to follow him and the seriousness of that call. I pray for each of us here today, Lord, young and old, that we would indeed take that call serious. We thank you for the life and death of our Lord Jesus Christ. That in him we have the forgiveness of sin. In him we are your adopted children. Lord, work in us this week by your spirit through your word to continue to shape and fashion us more and more after Christ. We pray this in his name. Amen. Thank you.